So far, we've been working without a firewall, but we all knew that wasn't going to last forever. Welcome to this video on SQL Server on Linux. My name is Kevin Fiesel. I'm the proprietor of Catalyxy Services LLC, a consulting firm which specializes in work all across the data platform space, especially SQL Server. So far in this series, I've focused on some of the administrative aspects of SQL Server on Linux around installing and configuring the product, as well as two additional bits of functionality in SQL Server integration services and Polybase. In this video, I'm going to give you a fairly simple overview of two aspects of network security we'll need in corporate environments, firewalls and encryption using transport layer security or TLS. I don't plan on spending too much time on an overview of the process, but we are going to talk a little bit about firewall rules and TLS certificates. So let's hop over to the classroom. When it comes to firewalls on Linux, everything starts with the NetFilter subsystem, which is part of the Linux kernel. NetFilter keeps track of network traffic that comes into your system and can decide where and how to route that traffic. The other relevant tool is called IP tables, a user-defined set of rules and behaviors for filtering. Think of NetFilter as the bouncer at a club and IP tables as the clipboard telling who gets in and who has to wait outside. Now I'm going to keep things really high level for this video, though I will link to a deeper dive into NetFilter and IP tables in the description of this video, so check that out if you're interested. Although I've talked about one kernel subsystem and one user space tool, we don't really interact with NetFilter. We could directly write IP tables rules, but instead we typically use a firewall configuration tool to manage that. The configuration tool I like to use in Ubuntu is UFW, the uncomplicated firewall. It's a simple firewall for simple tasks. You might have something more complicated in your corporate environment, but then again, you probably also have dedicated firewall systems and installable agents in your corporate environment. I don't have any of that, so I'm rigging up the poor man's version. By default, Ubuntu comes with UFW installed, but disabled. In other words, if you have any sort of TCP problems with your brand new Ubuntu install, it's probably not the firewall, it's DNS. It's always DNS. Anyhow, we're going to use this firewall to build out some rules and see if we can lock down our SQL Server instance without breaking everything. The other thing I'd like to do is encrypt connections. By default, SQL Server may transmit data over plain text using a protocol known as the Tabular Data Stream, or TDS. This is a fairly efficient way of moving data across the network, but does not uh, guarantee that it will protect sensitive data. What we can do, however, is set up a transport layer security certificate and enable TLS support. So that way, the data sent over this stream is encrypted and somebody snooping on your network with a copy of Wireshark or some other packet capture software won't know what's in your tables. This is the plan, so let's get to it. Here we are in Azure Data Studio. I want to point out that I'm connected to SQL VM0 and can run a query. It's a simple query, but the fact that I can run it is enough for now. Now we're going to switch over to the SQL VM0 box. The first thing I'm going to do is turn on the uncomplicated firewall. It says that the firewall is active and enabled on system startup. Let's switch back to Azure Data Studio and see what that does. At this point, the query is still working, so everything looks good except that it mentioned the firewall will work on system restart. So let's reboot this VM. This is gonna take me a moment to restart the VM. I'll have to type in my password. I'll have to click some buttons, you know, do, do some basic work. It will go through the process of rebooting and then I can connect back to it. Okay, now we're back. Let's run the query again. This time around, we're not going to see success because the firewall is blocking access to all inbound ports by default. I could wait for the query to fail, but that may take 45 seconds or so. So how about instead we just fix the problem? Let's open up the terminal app again and run a new command to open up port 1433 inbound. We can see that it added a firewall rule. Now let's check to see how things look in Azure Data Studio. 
This time around, my query returns in practically no time at all, now that I've unblocked everything. I could open up a few other ports, like, for example, port 22 if I want to allow remote access via SSH. But for SQL Server on Linux, the only port we need to open up is TCP 1433. But there is one other port we probably want to open, 1434. Port 1434 is the port SQL Server uses for the Dedicated Administrator Connection, or DAC. This can be useful when your SQL Server instance is in trouble and is otherwise non-responsive. SQL Server on Linux supports the DAC, so we could open up the port for it in case we ever need to use it. There's a lot more we can do with UFW, like say, specifying protocols or valid IP address ranges. And for a production system, I would recommend you do this. As an example, let's suppose that there are six servers that should be able to access our production SQL Server instance, and their IP addresses range from 172.20.149.73 through 172.20.149.78. If we know that there will never be any other IP addresses outside of this range, and we want the tightest fit using CIDR notation, we could build out the following rule to allow those servers access to the SQL Server instance over TCP. This would allow access for IP addresses 72 through 79. It's an eight IP range. We can also check the status of our rules to make sure that they are what we expect them to be. We can see our basic rules that we created to allow anybody in on ports 1433 or 1434, and then the narrower rule for just our production servers over TCP. I could then drop the basic rule for 1433 and prevent anybody outside this IP address range from accessing that SQL Server instance. Now there's obviously a lot more we could do with firewalls, but this is enough to give you the basics of how to limit access to a SQL Server instance based on an IP address. Polybase over to another SQL Server instance will work just fine, just as long as you have the rules set up that allow the host SQL Server instance to communicate with the remote data source. Most of the time, we don't block outbound traffic from a machine. In that case, access to resources like Azure Blob Storage and S3 will continue to work. But if you're on a server where public outbound internet access is prohibited, then we have to start talking about virtual networks, site-to-site -site VPNs, and the like, and that's not a topic for today. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Transport Layer Security, or TLS. TLS is the internet standard for encrypting communications between two devices. It's pretty fast and quite effective, making it a solid choice for connections. In the intro, I mentioned that SQL Server does not encrypt connections by default. That's kind of true, but also fudges things a little bit. Uh, let me explain how. Here I am in SQL Server Management Studio, Microsoft's venerable tool for connecting to SQL Server instances. If I open up a new connection to my SQL VM0 machine, I can select the Options button and navigate to the Connection Properties tab. There are two optional connection properties, Encrypt Connection and Trust Server Certificate. By default, these are off for SSMS. Let's see what happens when I select Encrypt Connection and then hit the Connect button. I get a nasty error message. The certificate chain was issued by an authority that is not trusted. It turns out that when you install SQL Server on Linux, it can create its own self-signed certificate. Because that certificate is self-signed, there is no trusted authority that looks at the cert and says, yep, that's definitely a valid certificate for this server. Nonetheless, if I decide to trust the self-hosted certificate, I can tick this box for Trust Server Certificate and then connect. Now SSMS will make the connection and everybody is happy. But this trusts that your users will remember to tick the boxes, or that your applications will send in a connection string with encrypt equals true and trust server certificate equals true. Can we trust that people will do that? I don't know, but probably not. Things are a little different in Azure Data Studio. Let's open up the connection screen here and select the SQL Server on Linux VM. There are a couple of options available in here, encrypt and trust server certificate. A note that encrypt, the default is mandatory and the default for trust server certificate is true. This means that we will automatically try to connect to the SQL Server instance using TLS and that we will accept self-signed certificates. 
Nonetheless, the first time you try to make that connection, you will get something that looks like an error message popping up in Azure Data Studio, asking if you really want to accept this self-signed certificate, and you will have to affirm that you do before you can connect. That only appears the first time, similar to how the first time you SSH into a server, you're asked if this is the right certificate fingerprint matching the server you expect to connect to. But before I connect to the server in Azure Data Studio, there's one other option in encryption that is interesting, strict. It turns out that as of SQL Server 2022, Microsoft has released a new version of their tabular data stream, TDS 8.0. With TDS 8.0, there's no longer an option for whether you want your data encrypted over the network. It gets encrypted, period. There are some features and functions that don't support strict encryption, such as availability groups, replication, the SQL Server agent, database mail, linked servers, and polybase connections to SQL Server. Also, SSMS doesn't support strict encryption yet. I'd consider TDS 8.0 to be the future of secure connections, but the future is probably not now. So let's switch back to mandatory encryption and trust the certificate, and then we'll connect to the VM. One last thing I'd like to show is how you can use your own certificate for SQL Server on Linux. There's a self-created one we can already use, but let's suppose you have a proper certificate. My sysadmins always told me they got theirs from the certificate fairy, so put a $20 bill under the pillow and when you wake up the next morning you should have a certificate there. Or something. I don't know how it works. But just to demonstrate the process, I'm going to create another self-signed certificate on this VM. Obviously, this isn't any better than using what SQL Server on Linux has already created as a default, but I don't really have the infrastructure to create a real certificate, so let's roll with it here. The first step is going to be to check the fully qualified domain name, or FQDN. I can use the host name command with the minus F flag to get that. The next step is to run a few commands. I got these from the Microsoft documentation, but I am making a few changes to get around some permissions issues I ran into along the way. I'm going to run OpenSSL to generate a new X509 certificate using the RSA algorithm with a bit length of 2048 and a subject saying this is the host name. I'll call the private key msql.key and the certificate msql.pen. This certificate will be valid for 365 days. From there, I'll make the msql account the owner of the certificate and the private key and make it so that MS SQL alone may read the cert. Warning alert. Uh, thank you for that warning alert. If you follow the Microsoft documentation as is, you will run into trouble because it has you run Chamad 600, which means granting read and write to the certificate and the private key. This will not work, or at least it did not work for me, and I got error 49940 in my logs. The reason is, the private key should never be writable to anybody, even the owner of the key. So let's avoid that error and make this Chamad 400 instead. The next step is to make a new directory called slash var slash opt slash mssql slash security and change the owner of it to the mssql account. Then we'll move the certificate and private key into that folder. The Microsoft documentation has you move the cert into slash Etsy slash SSL slash certs and the private key into slash Etsy slash SSL slash private, but I did have some permissions issues getting it to work, so I decided I'll just be special and create my own folder instead. Let's kick off the command now. And we have our certificate in place. As a reminder, this is a self-signed certificate. Ideally, you have a real certificate from a real certificate provider, and then you would perform the last four steps of that command to change ownership, move the certificate, and move the key into the correct directories. Now let's make SQL Server use our certificate. First up, I'm going to check the mssql.conf file to see what we've already got in place. We can see that SQL Agent is enabled, that we've accepted the end user licensing agreement, we're running on port 1433, and we have the trace flag for Polybase enabled. Now I'm going to stop the SQL Server instance and get cracking. 
We're forcing the use of a TLS certificate and key, setting the TLS protocol to 1.2, which is the current standard. TLS 1.3 is upcoming and Tabular Data Stream 8.0 does support it, but for now, TLS 1.2 works just fine and is the norm for a lot of applications. We'll also force encryption, which is a server-side flag that requires all clients to form encrypted connections regardless of what the client itself desires. The last step is to restart our SQL Server instance. If I want to check those MS SQL Conf settings again, I can do so to make sure everything looks good. Now we can see that everything did get picked up and our server is running, so let's try to connect. I'm back in SQL Server Management Studio. I'll try connecting and, in options, I will uncheck the boxes to encrypt connection or trust server certificate. Then I'll hit connect. Pretty soon we get, well, we get an error message saying the certificate chain was issued by an authority that is not trusted. I'm perfectly trustworthy and yet SQL Server Management Studio doesn't believe me. This is actually a good sign for us because it tells us two things. First. It says that we are forcing encryption from the server side. So even if a client like SSMS does not have the encrypt connection box selected, we're still going to encrypt the connection. The second thing that tells us is that even with server side encryption on, we are not going to accept this certificate automatically. So we do need to go back to the options menu, select connection properties, and then choose trust server certificate because I am, as I mentioned, a pretty trustworthy fellow. You can believe me, I'm trustworthy. For a real certificate issued by a real authority, you won't need to perform this step because it will already be a trustworthy certificate. This is an artifact of me using a self-signed and inherently untrusted certificate. But with that, we're now connected with enforced encryption. It's not too shabby. Over the course of this video, we looked at two important security considerations around SQL Server, whether on Linux or Windows. The first was firewall configuration. In many corporate environments, there's usually some firewall appliance sitting at the edge of the network and maybe another dedicated appliance inside the network for traffic filtering. So this may not be something you do on your fancy corporate box, but if you have a standalone SQL Server VM running in Azure or AWS or something, it can be a smart idea to limit traffic. The other thing we handled was TLS certificates, something that is quite important for end-to-end -end security. These TLS certificates allow us to encrypt traffic between our SQL Server instance and any clients. We can force encryption from the server side using MS SQL Conf and protect the precious data transiting over our network. We'll have links and show notes in the description below. And until we see each other in the next video, take care.